Welcome, everyone. Welcome. Good afternoon. Welcome to the third webinar for the Digital Justice Grant Program Fall Webinar Series titled Cultivating Community Partnerships in Digital Humanities. If you missed the first webinar, which was a general information session about the program, its ethos, design, and application components, or the second webinar about digital tools, methods, and deliverables, we now have those recordings available on the Digital Justice Program site, along with um, transcripts as well. So my colleague Katie is going to pop those into the chat just in case uh, you need that for your reference. So welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Kiana Nurse. I'm a Senior Program Officer of IDEA Programs and also Program Lead of the Digital Justice Grants Program. I'm joined by my colleague, Katie Rice, Program Associate of IDEA, who's moderating uh, one of the breakout sessions and also keeping an eye on the tech behind the scenes. So if you're having any trouble with sound or accessing one of the breakout rooms, you can chat her directly in, uh, in the Zoom chat. So before I introduce our very esteemed interlocutors who've joined us today, I want to say a few words about the intention behind this webinar series. As I mentioned in our most recent webinar, we started this series last year really as an effort to provide a forum for applicants to directly engage with former reviewers of our digital grants program. So that includes digital justice, our sunsetting digital extension program, and also our digital commission. Not everyone you know, has access to the informal information sharing networks that can really determine whether or not one writes a proposal that gets funded. So these webinars sought to unveil some of that hidden curriculum of grant writing and to provide some specific insights into different aspects of this program. But just as other parts of the program have evolved and been refined, so too have these webinars. This year's webinar series has been curated based on feedback from reviewers about areas where they see the applicant pool needing more coaching, and also from applicants who expressed a desire for more advisement on specific components of their application. They attended last year's sessions, uh, those applicants, and completed our post-webinar survey. So I'm grateful that we've been able to actualize some of that feedback into a session that dives more deeply into some of the concrete aspects of digital projects that our viewers for this program evaluate. And I also say that to encourage you to complete the survey that we'll pass on to you at the end of the session. So with that said, I would like to introduce our first interlocutor, Dr. Charlotte Nunez, who is the Dean of Libraries at Lafayette College in Easton, Pennsylvania. She works closely with library staff, as well as partners across campus and beyond to build capacity for community-led collections, community-engaged scholarship, uses of experimental technologies and research in teaching, and impactful co-curricular experiential and professional development opportunities for students in archives and libraries. Our next interlocutor is Dr. Ricardo Puntalan, who is an associate professor at the School of Information and director of Museum Studies Program at the University of, Mission, of Michigan, and also currently co-chair of the Archival Repatriation Committee of the Society of American Archivists and on the Board of Trustees of the Library of Congress American Folk Life Center. He also co-directs Reconnect, Recollect, Reparative Connections to Philippine Collections at the University of Michigan, a project that develops the framework for and the practice of reparative work for Philippine collections acquired by the university during the U.S. colonial period. So I'm really, really excited about the conversation that we're going to have today, as well as, again, offering some space um, for them to engage with you directly about aspects of your application. So before we get started, I just want to quickly outline our agenda so you have a sense of what's to come over the next hour and a half. So as I said, we'll start this session with about 30 minutes of discussion related to the topic. So thinking through how to sustain and maintain community partnerships in digital humanities. So that discussion has been specifically curated around the application prompts that ask about those relationships with community partners, as well as some of the other application components, such as the statement of support, the work plan, or the budget that your partners would appear in. We'll then transition into breakout rooms with an interlocutor and an ACLS staff member in each. This will give you an opportunity, again, to get some feedback on how you're approaching those two prompts. 
The first session uh, where we have the general discussion will be recorded again so that colleagues who can't make it or if you want to pass this resource along to others, they can still benefit from hearing this discussion. But as we transition into the breakout rooms, those will not be recorded. And I would ask that everyone respect a sort of very strong ethos of confidentiality for those conversations as people are thinking through certain dimensions of their application, whether or not they're going to apply this year or apply next year. I think we all sort of want to maintain a space of integrity and sort of offer a, a collaborative space where people feel safe to actually think through some ideas and get some feedback. So once we transition out of those breakout sessions, we'll then reconvene as a larger group and I'll offer some closing remarks, offer some housekeeping details about the subsequent uh, webinar sessions that are still in the pipeline, and then also um, just some dates that you should keep in mind in terms of the application deadline and, and the like. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so we can all see each other. So, all right and get started with our discussion. So again, thank you, uh, Ricky and Charlotte, for, for being here, for again, graciously offering your time to have this conversation with me um, and to frame it in a way that I think, that I hope is gonna be helpful for applicants. And so as I have been in the position of administering this program, interacting with prospective applicants, grantees, reviewers, really try to break down these questions into areas, um, three areas, so ethics, relationship building, and also project design with respect to how folks are thinking about their community partners and also how they talk about them in their applications. So the first question that I wanna ask, and this comes from a question that we get a lot from prospective applicants, is do all digital justice projects need to feature community partners? Is there a way to design and execute an ethically sound digital justice project that doesn't feature any extra, uh, extra external community partners? Ricky, do you want to start? <laughs> sure, I can. I can start. I I'll, I'll say. Um, well, the first um, mantra that I have that I'm pretty sure like people on this uh, webinar are aware of is like nothing about us without us, right? So it's uh, really important that, um, you know, the, you know, you, you abide by this before you start, like, you know, uh, so that said, I will say sometimes there's, um, you know, uh, there are, there will be projects that I think would emanate from, you know, like an effort by the community for the community. Uh, so in that sense, it's not really partnership. This is an effort by the community, right? So I guess, you know, I my, my framing is more like uh, you, you still have to, you know, define for yourselves and your project what partnership really means and what collaboration really means but the thing for me is like when i'm let's say i presented a project or doing a project myself um you know like the community partnership uh changes when it's from the community like meaning it could be like youth within the community or um you know elders in the community elders and the youth uh in the community and and things like that because you know we're doing this together so partnership becomes uh within the community and members of the community and those who are outside of that community but primarily you know working with me so uh, to me it's uh yeah, it's absolutely necessary that you define that relationship and partnership. And sometimes it means it's doing it as, as a community, uh, you know, where there's no real need for um, external partnership, but because it's initiated by the community. So, that, so that's my perspective. To me, there's no escape. You have to work from the vantage point of community relationship. Yeah, um, I would agree and, and build on that a little bit. Um, I really like your point, Ricky, about really defining what partnership means in the context of a given um, project. Um, and, you know, my my relevant background, I think, for this conversation has to do with facilitating kind of like channeling campus resources towards community led, you know, beyond campus community led collection building. 
um, and sort of building and facilitating mutually, you know, recip reciprocal relationships between campus partners and community partners that are really meaningful and impactful for everybody involved. And that takes a lot of getting around the table and talking. Um, with each other, just sort of creating a space for those conversations, talk about um, what the various kind of hopes, expectations, um, stakeholder responsibilities, et cetera, are, and just having a lot of time and space for those types of conversations. Um, that said, I think um, also anecdotally, I would say a lot of the um, community-led collections projects that I have been party to or involved in in any way, there's such a desire for engagement. They really want to see um, audiences, all kinds of different audiences engaging with those materials. So if they have put a lot of effort, time, resources into building um, a collection of primary sources pertaining to um, a certain history to sort of see engagement with, with those resources, I think is incredibly meaningful and impactful. And I think there's a real potential for this grant program to do interesting things <laughs> with with collections um, that have that have already been built, where the content is there, and then it's about engaging with it um, using experimental technologies or you know other maybe kind of like new innovative ways of engaging um, with with collection content. So that's one one way I look at that question. Um, and then I also think a lot. Um, Ricky and um, Kiana and I talked about this a little bit in a in a prep call about looking at an institution's own history and what, uh, you know, sort of communities within that institutional history um, might be kind of resonant and relevant for um, a grant project like this. Um, so I think that that's also um, a really kind of fruitful line. So I think, you know, there are ways to think about sort of external community partnerships and then maybe a little bit more internal community partnerships, all of which could fall under the umbrella of this program in really productive ways. Yeah, I love that thread, uh, particularly of, again, sort of defining specifically what the nature of the partnership looks like, and then also sort of thinking about the complexities of engaging with communities outside of institutions of higher education. And again, you know, I think that part of doing that work is a, is a sort of reparative process, and we'll get to that discussion a little bit later. And then also thinking about how communities exist within, you know, institutions of higher education and how they fit within a project um, and so, you know, from both of your perspectives, as you're, as you've been familiar with the program and sort of seeing how a lot of these projects do feature community partners. And as I've said before, it's not a coincidence that they do, given the thematic focus on, you know, marginalized communities and their histories. If projects do feature community partners, what are one to two signs that the project or the project team has built sort of an ethical partnership, um, you know, as you either assess applications or even as you're thinking about your own work, like what are some characteristics of those relationships that I think people can latch on to as green flags? Um, I can say that I often will go straight to the budget because I think that that is very revealing of, um, you can learn a lot from how the budget is set up for a project about whether there are higher, you know, whether there's kind of an ethos of equity um, right, and sort of like fairness and compensation across all all partners on a project, um, both on campus and beyond, or if there's a little bit more of a power dynamic of a higher sort of sense of hierarchy, right, I think that can come across really strongly in a budget. So I, I find myself when I've done grant review work um, with ACLS, checking out the budget kind of first, and then looking at the grant narrative and seeing, you know, kind of how those things, um, how those things bear out, and then that's a, I like that kind of red flag, green flag um, framework that you use because there, it can be subtle, right? I'm, and I'm trying to think, maybe Ricky, you could say a few words and maybe that'll kind of get me thinking a little bit, but it's one of those things you sort of know it when you see it. And you're like, oh yeah, this is a good, you know, reciprocally productive, like clearly the groundwork has been laid here. There's a conversation happening here um, that where um, that is an, that is an inclusive conversation, that's a multifaceted conversation that's accounting for nuance and complexity. Um, so I'm trying, I'm trying to think about how to sort of put that in a nutshell in this conversation, but Ricky, maybe you could say a few words and maybe I can circle back. Yeah, for me, um, I would say, yeah, I, I agree with you that there are subtle things, right? The first one being, um, in a reciprocal re relationship or a, a project like this, yeah, you you look at the budget. You also look at you know positionality, like who's who's driving the project and who are 
uh, you know, involved and how people are compensated, right? Um, so to me, you know, the, the the sharing of resources is big, you know, like I, I see um, we don't do this much, uh, much of this anymore, but before it used to be when you say I'm working with, let's say, uh, tribal or indigenous communities, and then they are my uh, respondents and consultants, but they're not paid. Uh, and there's no uh, equivalent in terms of generosity around, you know, like in many communities, gift giving is big. And I don't, I don't, I don't see in the budget that you have like a portion for gift giving. I'll just start saying, well, how are you compensating, you know, your community partners for their time? Um, so a second for me is like a uh, lack of like, a kind of acknowledgement of of the power dynamic that happens because in, in a reciprocal relationship the you know power is still present and uh, it flows back and forth you know how are you sharing that power um in and uh, to me it's just like it's something that i look for like that kind of recognition that there's a power dynamic in here and this is this is how we are correcting some of the you know like um imbalance and it's it is often the case i think that research is not what the community needs so i'm also looking for some aspect where it's not always driven by your research question you know like it's you know a lot of scholars will begin by you know we have um you know a significant gap in this research and by partnering with the community i will answer this research and it's all about research and i always say you know, what if research is not the intervention that's needed by the community? So how are you how are you accounting for that? Did you come up with this research question or um, something, you know, like the project that you're doing with the community? Did you work together to, to you know, answer this question uh, or to begin with? Because, you know, to me, that positionality and that power dynamic especially a lot of the work uh, is driven by people based in academic um, institutions, I think is, is very crucial. So I, I look for those uh, uh, clues. Yeah, I, I really like how you put that. And <clears throat> I would I would add a little, like sort of build on that a little bit. That's exactly right. I mean, I think that that's what, ideally that's what reciprocity looks like in these processes where the there is a very clear community need. Like there's a, a desire to kind of document or narrate that aligns with the research goals of um, the campus partner, research teacher, you know, whatever the sort of like academic mission goals are. Uh, I think that the most successful projects, those th those things are brought together in in really nice alignment, and they they're just they there's a an ease to the alignment. You know, it it, it truly is um, a productive you know productive prospect for all parties involved, and it's meeting the needs of all parties involved. Yeah, I love that, and I I want to skip around a little bit in terms of the order of the questions because of where we've landed in terms of thinking about like the budget or the extent to which the community partners are are sort of leading or framing the line of inquiry, um, which leads me to ask about other components of the application where you would assess that relationship. So as you know, we have now um, a sort of brief statement of community support that if folks do have extramural community partners that we ask them to provide that letter of support. So someone from the community writes that letter to give us a different perspective of what that relationship looks like. Um, and so I'm wondering, like, as you think about some of the other components of the application, um, again, that kind of red flag, green flag, what are like different types of information that you could convey with those other, with those other components? Um, that's a question that I wanted to, to pose and then just also add as someone who is kind of like a fly on the wall with the deliberations and then also reads the, the application sometimes and then managing grants after they're they're awarded, the question of time appears consistently in terms of working with community partners because the way that we think about work in the academy through semesters like doesn't really align to the cadence of work with the community partners that you operate or that you work with. So just also thinking about that in terms of like how you develop a, a work plan. So I wanted to offer that as a kind of fly on the wall perspective from a, a program officer. But again, uh, to this question of different components of the application, what kinds of things uh, would you say are red flags, green flags that um, you would assess in terms of how people are talking about or articulating their relationship? So for me, um, 
most of the projects that I see is, um, you know, out there creating something like a, like a digital tool or, uh, you know, something that you're creating and co-creating, right? And um, so sometimes, you know, I sit back and think about whether, um, you know, the project has considered that indeed this tool is the answer or, you know, that it's elevating uh, certain, uh, whether it's elevating certain narratives that's not there, but you know who 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 will be the audience and how will this uh carry forward uh for the community because i i just think that you know uh I, maybe uh, it will be more tangible if i give examples right for instance you know let's say you're uh saying oh we have an indigenous collection uh like close to my heart in in, in the philippines uh, that we need to uh, you know, share to community members. And and we heard that there's a community buy-in and, and things like that. And then we will create this magnificent, uh, um, uh, you know, website that features this, this, and this, and this, right? You know, and then I will ask about like practical logistics, like, okay, I want to know like uh, whether, um, you know, there's broadband in that community that's reliable, uh, whether they will, people will actually interact, will, will teachers use them in, in the classroom? Um, you know, you know, all those like, you know, deep knowledge of the realities, you know, like that, that the audiences and the communities you're serving. Um, because, you know, like not all institute, uh, not all communities will have the same robust digital infrastructure like we do, uh, you know. So to me, I begin to wonder if it's like, I know that in that space, uh, electricity is only 12 hours a day. Like in an entire university, there's only probably five computers, uh, you know, in, in that space. Like, how are you, how is this the answer, right? So uh, I'm not saying that we should avoid digital projects because, you know, th that's the point, right? But have you considered other things, you know, like that, that's uh, just outside of this conversation normally. And th this is where, like, I look for that in, in a narrative, right? You know, I look for that kind of awareness because for me, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, if you cannot articulate that, may maybe you should invest more towards relationship building and, and community uh, work, uh, or maybe that should be reflected in, in, um, uh, in the budget by saying, you know, what, what, you know, in this place though, there's, um, uh, let's say uh, the, the cell phone is what people use. So we're designing something that's, you know, more useful in, in a cell phone. So don't judge this based on, and you know, like, so the, the design and, uh, you know, like consideration of many other uh, facets to, you know, what it means to provide access and and you know and that that could only be uh, developed by by co-designing the project with community members. So so I'm looking for those you know and like those symmetry and alignment uh, and then consideration. Yeah, I think that's. I just want to jump in and say that's like really wonderful insight for how to approach the specific question that we are asking about, like capacity building and about what the general infrastructure ecosystem you exist in. What does that look like and how are the grant funds gonna sort of complement that? Um, because again, it's not sort of meant to put pressure on folks to say like, with $25,000, I'm gonna solve all of these problems. But again, it does, like you said, it gives you as a reviewer more context around like the, the ecosystem, whether that be within your institution, but also the ecosystem that your community partners are existing in and the interaction between the two so that when folks are reading the materials, they have like a concrete sense of that. Uh, Charlotte, sorry, sorry to jump in front of you, but I just wanted to connect, <laughs> please, please. connect that to the uh, specific part of the application. Yes, always jump in front of me. I love it. <laughs> um, yes, the um, you know your your turn of phrase, like you like carrying it forward, right? like carrying the work forward. I feel like that relates a lot to something I'm always looking for in these proposals, which is a really strong kind of digital infrastructure statement and that could be part of the work plan. And it, you know, could emerge in other elements. Um, but I think demonstrating that there has been some thought, exploration, discussion around what the sustainability plan is for a project, 
um, is really critical. And it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, when I say sustainability, it doesn't necessarily mean it needs to be a digital project that's going to live forever. I think that's that's never the expectation. That's not realistic. But I think to sort of show that there has, you know, sort of what the work, what the what the plan is, what the hope is, and then, you know, working backwards from that, like who have you partnered with on, on your campus or um, you know, what kind of resources, relationships do you have in place? Is there a line of communication with the library? Is, you know, the looking for those signs that there has been some careful thinking and groundwork laid um, to sustain a project in that there are not a lot of assumptions being made about, oh, the digital scholarship folks will help us, or oh, the librarians will help us, or, you know, it's, it's you know, with the lens that I bring to reviewing these proposals, I'm always looking out for that because I'm a librarian, so I'm sensitive to it. <laughs> um, how how people can kind of get pulled in on things that where they weren't kind of part of the project proposal process. Um, so I think being really um, reflective um, about any any kind of under under any kind of assumptions um, that you or others on the project might be making about resources that will would need to be in place in order to make the project successful is important. Yeah, I think that's a that's also a helpful reminder for if folks are interested. We did two webinars last year about this question of capacity building and sort of the different kinds of considerations that one can begin to think about as they assess their own institutional landscape and what's available to them and what kinds of questions to ask folks in their libraries or you know what kinds of resources um, to look out for. So that those webinars um, from last year, the recordings of them are still on the digital justice site for folks who are interested in, in checking that out. Um, I do wanna sort of circle back to how we initially opened this conversation in terms of thinking about um, sort of community partnership and scoping out the specific contours of that. Because again, it's very different to sort of engage in the work of building a relationship with a community that exists outside of an institution of higher education versus one that exists within it. And obviously there's there can be some overlap depending on the positionalities and the identities of those communities. But I do think that, you know, given how higher education uh, institutions have functioned historically, like we do have to grapple with that history of extractive knowledge um, practices, and then in some cases, physical displacement and position and dispossession. And so I'm wondering from both of your perspectives, you know, because digital justice as a program and as a whole tries to support projects that have some kind of restorative outcome, uh, how would you sort of advise folks to think about the, the importance of repair or the role of repair um, as they're going about relationship building and relationship maintenance with their, with their community partners. Um, yeah, and I think that this is an especially important sort of topic for this grant because even as scholars, if you have like a particularly marginalized identity, in those moments, you still kind of function as an avatar for your institution. So having to like, navigate what that looks like and, and take on that work of repair. Um, any thoughts you could offer on that would be great. You can start, or you could, Ricky, either way. <laughs> okay, I'll go ahead. Um, yeah, I think I think coming coming at things in a spirit of inquiry is extremely important. So, um, uh, you know, having an understanding about what, and it's, yeah, it's hard to talk about these things in the abstract. I do feel like examples are good, <laughs> sort of. Um, so I'm thinking about one digital collection building um, project that I worked on with the Eastern chapter of the NAACP. Um, and this is a very long standing, you know, this chapter has got deep history in Easton, Easton PA, um, this is where Lafayette College is located. Um, and I think there have, been, there have been various interactions, good and bad, with the college, Lafayette College, where I work over the course of many decades, you know, as, as, as <laughs> you know, I think that's a, that's a common story. Um, and so I think in, it was really important to me in the beginning of that project to kind of understand, like, how do you see the college? And like, what can I do for you? Like, as, a, as, as you say, like an avatar of the college, like, what, what would you like to see out of this partnership? Like, what it would be useful for your chapter, um, the, you know, kind of history, what would you be looking to get out of a partnership with the college? Kind of really starting with those questions as opposed to coming in and being like, hey, we're we've got this really great group of faculty and students and they want to do X, Y, and Z thing. What do you think? Want to get on board with that? You know, it's just sort of 
flipping that um, a little bit and really starting with a lot of careful and um, considerate questions that are attuned to blind spots you may have about how um, you know certain individuals you're talking about might feel about the institution that they see you aligned with. Yeah, so so I would begin by, you know, um, I kind of got focused on the word repair. Like, you know, in, in our line of work, what are we really repairing? Uh, you know, typically, uh, if you're in the library archives museum profession, you will say, oh, I'm, I'm fixing the metadata. <laughs> you know, that's why I'm doing reparative description. I would say, yeah, but you know, what's the larger goal? Why, why is this? You know, why, why do you want to feel? Oh, because you know, our metadata is offensive, and they, they, they contain, you know, uh, uh, racial language that's uh, going to discourage community members uh, from using because it's it's racist, right? So to me, then therefore, what you're repairing is uh, the the harm that you know, these uh, metadata schema that you're using or the way you present the materials. Uh, so again, you know, like uh, like ask, that, ask yourselves that question, what am I trying to repair? I, most of the time, it's not really the object that you're repairing, it's the relationship, right? So when the relationship is not there, how are you building the relationship and how is this uh, project going to build uh, that will, you know, it will, you know, like to me, a digital project should begin and end in better relationships. That's that's the bottom line for me. So in, in your, your starting point, how are you starting with relationship? How is this project or a digital product or whatever you're trying to do going to further that relationship and then better relationship that will end out of this? So so to me, the, the repair has always been these relationships that's broken the trust, the trust that's not there, or um, you know, if it's an existing relationship, making it better, right? And by by doing this project together or producing some something tangible out of the project, then that produces that. So, so yeah, like asking the larger um, question of what are we uh, repairing, uh, and often to me it's a question of relationship, relationship between community different communities or relationship between your institution and communities, the collection and the communities that the collection represents, or um, you know, uh, stories that are not otherwise uh, collected, but otherwise would be um, you know, or or lost if we do don't do this project and will be collected and then uh, producing those uh, uh, connections that otherwise will never exist. Uh, and your project is enhancing those uh, connections or creating those connections. You know, so so for me, um, um, it's so easy for all of us to you know Im imagine um, what we're repairing, just like in the road. It's like I'm repairing the potholes, but actually, most of the time we're repairing the potholes because we don't want we want the, our drivers to be safe. We want uh, we want to get to our destination. Uh, we 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 want people not annoyed whenever they drive like you know community well-being and things like that so for me the object of repair while you are you know you might zero in on like i want to uh, put asphalt in that pothole it's actually those other things that are uh, driven towards you know the destination of community well-being that is a really really amazing metaphor um, because it, it, I think it helps me articulate something that, again, as a fly on the wall, I sometimes see with um, applications that, that come in where the claims that the project advances equity and justice are actually simply supported by the creation of something that doesn't exist or uh, documenting a history that's been ignored. And to me, that is not quite enough, right? Because it doesn't really take fully into uh into like considering the context of why why those things are missing in the first place, why having those things would matter to the people that the objects are about or the tools are about in the first place. Um, and so really moving away 
from this idea that like I'm doing a justice oriented project simply because like black people are at the center of it and beginning to ask those further questions of like I have developed a project that in in collaboration with this community because of particular reasons that they've articulated to me that are going to get to a place of of repair um and I think that that's a really important sort of centralizing sort of theme of this program that we try to aspire to as well. Um, so thank you for for offering that metaphor. I'm gonna I'm gonna use it, but I will cite you. <laughs> um, so relatedly again, I think in terms of thinking about the importance of of context in our last session on uh, digital tools and methods and deliverables, we had a little bit of a discussion around how the very selection of the particular tools or methods that are at the center of your project um, should be thought about in consideration with the community partners that you're working with, um, precisely as we think about, you know, one avenue of this question of accessibility. Like, even if you're trying to make something that is open source and that is easily accessible, if you have to save most of it on like a university server that your community partners don't have access to as you're developing the project, you know, having those considerations of how different tools and methods can mediate your relationship is something to, to think about. And so what are, again, one or two considerations that applicants should consider with respect to how those specific digital tools or methods can inform or even mediate, you know, the relationship that they have with their, with their extra communal community partners? So I'd say, you know, Let's keep in mind that most of the time, uh, universities, uh, even public libraries, uh, and many uh, centers where we have, um, where collections are housed or kept, uh, and in including um, academics leading uh, you know, the charge in, in, in some of these digital projects. A lot of them are heavily um, focused on, uh, you know, the, the, in the first place, materials were there or created, uh, collected because of some kind of academic um, reason, right? Like, let's say papers of an anthropologist. Yeah, like, you know, this person did field research or let's say, uh, you know, uh, papers of someone that ended up in, in, in a, in a, in an archive um, that's uh, an academic, uh, you know, unit. Uh, uh, many of the things are already framed from a particular disciplinary standpoint, uh, and and already already coming to communities with with that particular interest, right? Like very academic. Uh, so um, I would say. Uh, you know, to answer this question, is like um, you know, you know, moving away from you know, or engaging the communities based on like uh, number one, the assumption that you know, community members are scholars in their own right that they they have uh, expertise, right? Um, and um. You know, I've seen uh, projects in the past that's that's very, uh, I would say, very uh, driven by the scholarship of the people who created the project. Like, let's say, um, um, linguistic collection that's been created by linguists, but nevertheless, uh, very essential and key in language revitalization, right? But if you look at the materials, they're very... They, they were created and could only be sometimes read by linguists because you need to have that expertise, um, subject expertise, right? But but it's necessary for language revitalization and for community building and uh, cultural work uh, in, in community. So, you know, uh, like have understanding that nuance, that the, the content and the collection, the creation is very academic, right? But it's useful to communities. How, what are the structures or uh, procedures in place that would allow that translation to happen, right? Because I, I don't believe that if we digitize everything and we create a website and everybody will just download them as if they are legible to community. So there has to be that intervention in between. Um, 
But at the same time, you know, recognizing that communities need to be in that conversation because you know what? I've seen many projects where um, community members are also interested in the in in the science that created the record or or um, let's say the 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 you know the the question that driven the researcher or whoever created those materials that you have and then you know like in, including them in in those uh you know academic and uh conversations because you know like in, in my experience uh it only just enhanced uh the the academic work that that I'm doing, like you know, like recognizing that there's a lot of intellectual contribution. So, so that that's one thing that uh, I would say, you know, um, you know, like is very important to me. It's just like, um, you, you know, recognition that I'm already coming from a position of like an academic work, uh, you know. Uh, already much of my work is predefined by the discipline that I carry, that I'm embedded in. Uh, so the question I ask myself is that, okay, uh, working with the community and then I explain this consciousness, the bias, the academic bias that's already embedded in the whole system like that I'm swimming in. I'll ask like, so what are your interests in this? What kind of translation that needs to be done for this to be useful beyond uh, academia, you know, it's, so that it's more, uh, the impact is more towards the community, you know, while recognizing that community members are also deeply interested in, in the science or the discipline that created these uh, materials that we have and that they have a particular say on how those knowledge is distributed or not, right? Like what areas of knowledge in here that you feel like we, we won't share that to the rest of the world because this is for us this is for the community but there are certain things that you know we can share right like i'm using some examples here or at least in my head from you know like more indigenous and native american experience right like there's certain knowledge are not meant to be shared and not meant to be given to academia but remain in the community so those those delicate negotiation is i think very important and then i will see it you know in in the in the um, tools or the methods that you present right like that you have this keen awareness of you know a kind of res uh, respect for community knowledge and community's uh, perspective on on who gets to uh use and benefit from that knowledge uh, by by looking at again going back to the first question around reciprocity and um and uh you know real partnership with communities so so i think you know uh i i think sometimes you know we we make these uh false uh, narratives in our heads that will say, well, you know, that's going to be impediment to knowledge production and uh, the seeking. Actually, if you do this community-based work long enough, you will realize that it's it's not. We've just been conditioned to say, uh, well, you know, I cannot create a project that will only benefit some people. Actually, we do this all the time in our lives, that we, we don't share everything. Why can't it be true for the academic products or tools that, that we create. I think the strongest project, you know, the ones that have sort of stayed with me, the proposals that I read, there was a real, um, Ken, you kind of got it a little bit in your comments a moment ago. There was kind of, there was the technology itself, like the digital component, the digital element was saying something about the project. You know, there was some, you know, there was, a way to kind of understand um, a, a sort of an a, a additional depth or layer to the meaning of the project by the tool or the platform or, you know, whatever the sort of experimental technology, digital kind of piece, um, what that the kind of role of that was in the project. Um, and I think really sort of giving some thought 
to how is the digital piece of this enhancing engagement, enhancing access, uh, those, because I think that in many cases, that's kind of the highest and best use of the technology is that it is in, it's enhancing engagement with really important content. Um, so I think a little bit of critical reflection on and on how the technology is enhancing engagement, enhancing, and, and not just in making stuff available via a website, but like actually sort of thinking about the kind of structures of the technology and how they're interacting with the content. And um, I liked what you're saying, Ricky, I, I, about actually, you know, ensuring that all partners on the project are part of that conversation about the technology, because that's, that's a relevant, you know, if these are digital justice grants, the technology is a big piece of them. Um, and I think the more kind of perspective you can get from all um, all stakeholders in a given project on the technology that's being proposed, the better. Because I think they're you know different um, stakeholders are going to bring a different kind of perspective on on the value of the technology and what their hopes and expectations are from it. And I think um, kind of documenting and narrating some of that can be really powerful in the space of a pro proposal. Yeah, I think the last thing I'll say before we um, head into the breakout sessions is that, you know, to that end of having these conversations where people not only share, um, you know, their concerns or thoughts or ideas about the central line of inquiry and having that be a driving force, but also the tech that you use to get to the answers to those questions. Um, it's incredibly important because, again, it shows up in things like the work plan, um, because you could read something and say, this is a great idea but there's no way you could do this in six months or 12 months or 18 months. Um, and it's it becomes very apparent that again, this sort of different sense of time, like how the university, how we operate according to university logics of time versus outside of that, you know, clashing within these parts of the application that get into more of the concrete nuts and bolts of that. So um, I just, again, wanted to to flag that for folks. I think Obviously, it's very important to work on your proposal narrative or the prompts, uh, rather, but really do think about those other components, the timeline, uh, the budget, the work plan, because it, in my mind, shows how you are actualizing those aspirational visions of justice, right? How you're yeah. like literally going about doing that work. And again, we will have another webinar that is called Operationalizing um, Digital Justice that gets into those, those more concrete components. Yeah. But as you can see, they, they've come up in this conversation, they came up in the last webinar. So um, just wanted to, to flag that for people. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna stop recording. All right, so again, I always hope that these sessions are useful for folks. As we close out, just wanna remind people about some um, concrete deadlines, dates that you should have on your radar. The deadline for applications is December 3rd. We can't offer any, any extensions, unfortunately. And again, this is also the date where the administrator that you have listed as the one to be submitting the institutional verification has to, has to submit that form. Once we receive all of the applications, we'll have a first round of review, again, because of the exploded amount of applications that we got last year. So now we have two rounds, but we will let people know about the status of your application in February 25, whether or not it's been uh, selected to go on to the next round or not. And that will also include feedback on your application. And then finally, decisions around which applications have been funded will be released in April of 2025. So in terms of the following webinar series, if you have any further questions about the program, whether or not your application or your project is eligible, if it's a good fit, if you're struggling through some of the application prompts and you just want a thought partner to think through some of these things, there'll be an office hour on October 29th. ACLS staff is, is me and Katie. So we will be there. It is a lot more informal than this setup. So you can come in and ask your question, get some feedback and then pop out or you can stick around if you're interested in just hearing what other things people are, are working through. On November 14th, we will again, as I said, have that session on operationalizing uh, DH projects. So again, digging into these more concrete elements of the project of how to go about doing the work. So how to craft a budget, thinking about timeline, thinking about, about work plans. And then there'll be a final uh, round of office hours on November 22nd. So right before the, the Thanksgiving holiday, um, as people are sort of thinking about hitting submit or not. <laughs> 
Um, so I want to thank Charlotte and Ricky for sort of giving us their time, their expertise, engaging in conversation, crafting this conversation uh, with me. I'm so appreciative of the work that they do, how they exist, their enthusiasm for the program. Um, peer review can be a little bit of a slog, but I'm trying to make that an enjoyable experience and working with them has, has certainly been a part of that. So I just wanna you know, give them an applause and thank them. And then the last note I'll say is that again, all of this work, this sort of work of digital justice is aspirational. You know, even the very certain elements of the design of the program we're actively working on to lower the barriers, right, so that more people can engage in this work. But in order to do that, we need feedback from people. So I'm going to ask my colleague Katie to pop into the chat, just a post-webinar survey that's five questions, just to get your take on whether or not this session was helpful. But it's also a space for you to um, sort of recommend different types of topics that you would want to see in subsequent uh, competitions for this webinar series. So as I mentioned, all of these topics that we have this year came out of the feedback that we got from the survey from last year. So we really do take those recommendations seriously. So enjoy the rest of your afternoon and good luck with your applications. If you have any further questions, please feel free to email digitaljustice at acls.org and we will get back to you as soon as possible. Right, take care, everyone.